Josh and Cassie, as Cassie's grandfather, has gone to be with the Lord. Um, he lived on this earth 98 years. Wow, what an amazing legacy that is. And so tomorrow is uh, viewing and, and uh, services, and so pray for them as we lift them up. Uh, pray for uh, Justin and Holly. Uh, again, as um, they're coming home tomorrow with the with the new baby, so it'll be exciting. We was up this afternoon in the midst of a snowstorm and got to spend some time with them. And I was I was really blessed not only by Justin and Holly, who are such an amazing couple, and um, just by what God is doing there and and, and uh, how everything just went so so well. But uh, amazing as you think as you walk down the hallway. Uh, to leave from Justin and Holly's room there at uh, Brunson Hospital. Right as you turn to go to the elevator, there's a big picture window. As you look out that window, there's the Alamo sitting right down there. I mean, it's just as plain as day. You can see it. And um, one of the nurses uh, that was in the room, um, she has heard uh, that we're putting a church there. And so she said, I can't wait. I want to be there the first Sunday. It was just amazing, you know. Uh, my, my family and I have been looking and looking and looking, and, and uh, she says, we, well, you don't know it, but we know Sandy Schwartz, and uh, we're good friends with her, and so we've been watching your church services on uh, the internet, and so we can't wait for the church in the Alamo. So uh, that's an encouraging thing, right? Amen? Yeah. Give God a hand. Yeah. Uh, I thought, wow, okay, here we go. So, <laughs> Amen. All right, Revelation chapter 19. Now, we've been through this book. This is, this is week 29 in this particular study. So over six months now we've spent in this great book of worship. A book that so many people are intimidated by because you think we can't understand it or talks about end times and those things. And what I just want to make sure that I continue to say is it's not a book about end times as much as it's a book about worship that talks about end times. And it's very simple to understand, and I, I've, tried to, I've tried to bring out the aspects of that. In, you could teach on this book from now until Jesus comes back, amen? Uh, it's an amazing, amazing book in the Bible. We've seen some great things, and, and we have uh, journeyed ourselves to chapter 19, verse 1. You ready? And after this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying, Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the 20 and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants who fear him, small and great. And now there's a transitioning scene that takes place in verse 6 to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And John says, Then I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of great multitude, like a roar of many waters, and like a sound of mighty pearls and thunders, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now a scene transition happens again in verse 11 and says, Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. And the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. 
He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. That's important to remember because it correlates with verse 7 and 8. We're following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepresses of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh is a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. With a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. Come gather for great, for the great supper of God. Now there's a difference there. There's the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then there's the great supper of God. It says, verse 18, to eat the flesh of the kings and the flesh of the captains, the flesh of the mighty men, the flesh of the horses, their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs, and by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, and burn with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the word that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So Father, bless the reading of the word to the hearing of our ear and receiving of our heart in Jesus' name. And everyone said? It's a powerful, powerful chapter because here we see the return of Jesus. What we've talked about, what we longed about, the whole aspect of of Christian faith is is built on the death, burial, resurrection, and the return of Jesus Christ. We, We read about the return in John chapter 14. Jesus said, if I go, I'm coming again. In Thessalonians, we hear Paul talk about uh, the catching up and the return of Jesus. And so it's very important as we come to this particular chapter that we see and hear and understand what's actually taking place. I, you know, as I thought about this, I was reminded of a, a, movie, a TV series that I loved back in the 80s um, when I was a young boy. I'm not very old now, but anyway. How many of you remember that TV show, The A-Team? Right? Oh my, right? Love the A-Team. They had a full-length movie here about it uh, some some time back or whatever. But in both the TV series and in the the movie, there is this uh, ex-United States Special Forces group that's led by this colonel named Hannibal Smith. Now, what I remember most about the colonel is he had this famous phrase. At the end of the show, when everything seemed to uh, not be able to work out, like the impossible happened, and it all came together, Hannibal would always make this phrase. I love it when a plan comes together. You remember that phrase? Love it when a plan comes together. I mean, it's one of the greatest quotes of all times. I love it when a plan comes together. Now, Revelation chapter 19 It's the final, it's the final coming together of God's plan. I mean, from Genesis all the way to now, we see that God has been building from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Revelation 19. I mean, if you read your Bible and you begin to understand it properly, you will see that everything that happens from Genesis all the way through to Revelation chapter 19 is all building up, it's all setting up for Revelation 19. Everything. This is the culmination of everything that's happened. And it's a blessed time, especially for those people who have been waiting uh, all throughout redemptive history for this particular chapter. It's the fulfillment of God's plan. In particular, Genesis chapter 3, verse uh, 15. If we, if we read that particular scripture, he, he tells, he tells the, 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 the serpent there that one day the Messiah would come and bruise Satan. And God made a promise to Abraham. He said, I'm going to bless all the people. 
on the earth through you. God promised to David that one of your descendants would sit on the throne forever. All the Old Testament prophecies, many we've looked at as we've journeyed through this book, finally completed and realized. And it's when, it's, when the, it's when the words that Jesus even spoke on the Mount of Olives are finally, finally realized. Now, reading through it, I'm kind of struck, if you will, with the contrast between the first advent of Jesus, which we celebrate at Christmas, Everybody always asks me, we do a little Advent thing here. Everybody's like, what is Advent? Every, every year we talk about hope, love, peace. Uh, the Advent of Jesus, the waiting on that, that first Advent of Jesus. If you contrast his first Advent to his return, what you see are some very striking things. In the Gospels, we're introduced to a Messiah who is, who is subject to humiliation and suffering and death. But in his return, we see triumph, glory, power, and dominion. He came 2,000 years ago as a savior, but in Revelation chapter 19, he comes as a judge. In his first coming, he wore a crown of thorns as he willingly yielded his life. And at his second coming, the Bible says he's going to be adorned with crowns as a picture of his complete dominion. His first coming, he was mocked. They placed a sign over his head. And they charged him with a crime of claiming to be the king of the Jews. When he returns... You'll claim his rightful place, the Bible says, as the king of kings and the lord of lords. At his first coming, he suffered the humiliation of dying on a cross. Do you understand that death on a cross was reserved for lower class people? If you were a Roman citizen, it was illegal for you to be uh, killed in that way. It was a torturous and agonizing thing. It was was so terrible that a law had to be made that if you were a Roman citizen, no matter what you had done, you couldn't be put to death that way. Hello, church. It was so bad. At his second coming... Here come in the glory of riding on a white stallion. Come on, church. That's the symbolism of a conquering king. When a king would come back from war, he would lead his troops. And he'd be riding on a white stallion. And that would be the symbolism of victory. When the people would see the king riding on a white horse, they would know the king has won, the king has conquered, and his troops would be behind him. And behind them would be the spoils of war. At his first coming, he willingly gave up his life to save others. And at his second coming, he's going to slay those who have refused to trust in him. Now, I want you to, want you to understand there's some great contrast as we look at this. There's another contrast that I think is very important that we see tonight between the fates of those who place their faith in Jesus and those who haven't. Three pictures I want to show you. Are you ready? First, the two suppers. How many of you have heard about the marriage supper of the Lamb? Some of you. How many of you heard about the other supper? We don't talk much about it. We talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb because that's the one we want to be at. Guess who's going to be serving at that dinner? Jesus. So you sit down to eat the marriage supper of the Lamb. He's going to be serving. Now the marriage supper of the Lamb is interesting. It's a, it's a powerful thing. Look, 
This is going to be a glorious celebration which Christ's followers will enjoy the finest foods and wine. And even more importantly, we get to fellowship face to face with Jesus. Imagine what it will be like to observe the Lord's Supper this way. To sit down and enjoy fellowship. Those who are invited to this particular supper was those who would be greatly blessed, those who have, who have put their faith in Jesus, those who have understood who Jesus is and let their faith lead them to him. He will be there to serve us. It's incredible. That's in deep contrast. Oftentimes we think, wow, that's it. That's where we arrived. That's all it. It's all said and done. But the great supper, the great supper of God is different. Verse 17 is described. Those who take part in this banquet, it's a little bit different. There will actually be the meal. Maybe this is a sobering chapter for you tonight. You're a little quiet. but Chapter 19, we see a more detailed event that we're introduced to, the, to, to back in chapter 14, if you remember that, where the harvest of the earth was described. Now, a massive army, after, after being deceived by the Antichrist and the false prophets, is going to fight. They're going to gather themselves together to fight against Jesus. We, we see this. We call it uh, uh, the Battle of Armageddon, right? I mean, that's what we call it. Uh, and, and the best scholars can think why it takes place in the Valley of Megiddo. And, and all of we've seen all of the movies. Hello, somebody. We, we get an idea of this great clash that will be such a clash that there will be such a straining. There will be such a battle like we've never seen before. Like when we see these great battles, we think, oh, it's Armageddon. It's the last man. It was, it was tooth and nail right down to the last guy. You know, it was the last man standing. It was the most epic battle. And when we hear about this battle, the battle of Armageddon, let me explain something to you. It's not going to be much of a battle. Do you understand that? It's, it's not going to be much of a battle. You've, you've got to understand that. The Antichrist, the false prophet, are going to be captured. They're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. We'll look at that uh, as we examine chapter 20. When, we'll see the lake of fire becomes the final everlasting place of torment for Satan and all those who have not placed their faith in Jesus. We've got to understand that this particular battle, as, as glorious as some of the Hollywood movies would like to make it, as, as, uh, as, as they would try to build it up into something that you, you're anticipating that's going to take like, you know, a thousand years to be done. No, it's not, it's not going to be much at all. The Bible says Jesus using his words, which um, are represented by the sword coming out of his mouth. It's, a, it's, a, it's the, you know, remember the Bible says that the word of God is a sword. It's sharper than two-edged, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces, dividing asunder. That's the word of God. And so we see this sword coming out of Jesus' mouth. And it, it represents the word of God. Every single member of the army that's gathered to fight against him will be slain. In an instant... In a moment. That's exactly what Isaiah said. Exactly what Isaiah said in chapter 11, verse 1. He said, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him in the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what... His eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Now, If you go to Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 through 4, you can highlight that. You can mark next to it. I mean, that is a reference to Revelation 19. It's Isaiah speaking of something that would come in the sense when God sets all things straight. See, the picture we get here is that everything's going to happen very quickly. It's not going to be much of a battle. I just want you to understand that. 
And once that occurs, then Jesus is going to send his angels to command the birds of the air to feast upon the flesh of the slain bodies. And that fulfills the actual words that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 28, when he says, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Now, unlike the marriage supper of the Lamb, those who take part in this supper, supper certainly aren't going to be blessed. Got to, you've got to remember that. And so we've got the two suppers that are compared here, the marriage supper of the Lamb, where we sit down and we fellowship face to face with Jesus. And it's, it's an ultimate reward of faithfulness. And, and it's, it's that aspect of being connected in fellowship with Jesus. And at the time of this writing, John would write this idea because people would see that sitting down at a table and eating food with people was a sign that you were committed in relationship. The great supper of God is much different. It's when everything that isn't of God is dealt with. And so there's two contrasts there for the suppers. There's also two contrasts with the armies. There's two armies. The Bible says the armies of heaven. If you read the message uh, paraphrase, it's not a translation, but it's a paraphrase. It, it often will say the angel armies of God. Right? And so sometimes we can get a little confused when we get into those aspects of things. And I encourage you um, to pay attention. When Jesus returns, he's going to be accompanied by an army of heaven. Now, you can expect there's probably a lot of disagreement by the common terries as, as to who comprises this particular army. But the text proves it if you just pay attention. Like I said, the Bible interprets itself. It's not very complicated in the sense that it, it, you can't understand what you're reading if we, under, if we will realize that the Bible will interpret itself. Seven. Verse 7 and 8, pay attention to this. Uh, the armies of heaven. Now in verse 7 and 8, I want you to grab a hold of this because it's very, very powerful. What we see here is this says, Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready, and it has granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. So verse 14 says what? And the armies of heaven arrayed in what? The Bible is interpreting itself. We get to see verse 14 is talking about those who are in verses 7 and 8. Now, so to me, it's clear then. If I read the Bible correctly, I let it interpret itself. I don't try to put my interpretations into it. I let it speak as God would have it speak. Then those who are arrayed in fine linen are those who are part of the bride, the church. And they're identified further on as saints. And that's a reference only to the followers of Christ. So... Since there are other references in your Bible to angel armies, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, it's certainly possible that the armies of angels in heaven will accompany Jesus and the saints. In particular at his return. But what's primarily in view here is that those who have been faithful to Jesus have the privilege of accompanying him at his return. Now, I don't know about you, but to me that sounds amazing. Let's talk about it in just a few moments, but I want you to notice here that the army in heaven who accompanies Jesus have no weapons. If you're going to go to battle, if you're going to go to war, right? You, you, it'd be like, where's my gun? Right? That's because Jesus does all the fighting, church. He, he's always done all the fighting. Hello, church. Be honest if you've gotten the way of Jesus dealing with your problems. Come on, let's be honest. If we've gotten the way sometimes of the Lord dealing with our own problems. Like God is saying, the battle's not yours. It's mine. Like we, we struggle to fight for victory and Jesus has already won the victory. Like, we don't stand in the victorious Christ. We feel like we've got to help Jesus out sometimes. 
Like, where's my weapon? And the Bible teaches us that you don't, you don't fight that way. But we do it all the time, right? Because we feel like, great, I'm in a spiritual battle. I've got to go to war. Where's my weapon? Jesus has always done all the fighting. Think about all the things you've overcome. Have you ever done it by yourself? Actually, it was when you surrendered to Jesus in the issue and let him deal with it that you got delivered from it. Right? It was like when you were depressed and you finally gave in to Jesus. Right? He brought the joy of the Lord in your life. Like you couldn't do enough good. You couldn't be happy enough. Like you couldn't just say, okay, I won't be discouraged anymore. Right? Every time you tried to push yourself out of darkness, it seemed like darkness just got darker. And then one day when you finally just let Jesus be Jesus, the darkness was lit up. When that problem that you couldn't deal with, you tried to push that rock up that hill all your life, and finally, when you just rested in the Lord, it was like the Lord just moved it. All of the struggle in our life, listen, all the work we've ever tried to do, it wasn't until we rested in Jesus and let him fight the battle that anything was done anyway. Come on, church, help me out. Is it true or not? Why do, we, why do we wrestle? God, I mean, sometimes it was just like God saying, well, let me know when you're tired. I can do that. I remember the struggle. You know, six months in our marriage, it was, it was terrible. It was awful. You know what I'm saying? And I was just, I thought, okay, I'll just be a better husband. How I many you know that lasted for about 10 minutes? So I didn't get my way. You don't need to help. <laughs> Struggle with my kids? Okay, I'll just be a better dad. Right? I'm excited. Tomorrow morning I get to go speak at All Pro Dads to all the dads in the community. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be early. 6.30. What am I going to talk about being a dad? I'm going to talk about being a dad of contentment. Just learning to rest in Jesus so that as we rest in the Lord, our kids see Jesus. It's all of that struggle. Think about your life, where you've been through, even what you're going through right now. You feel like you've got to take it in your hand and you've got to manipulate it and control it and fix it. And all that wrestling. And Jesus is saying, let me know when you're done. He's always done the fighting, church. Even, even for your security in heaven. Who, who wrestled that out? It was the Lord. The army of God just merely follows God. And it's completely consistent again with Isaiah chapter 63, verses 1 through 6, when it said, Who is this who comes from Edom? In crimson garments from Bozorah. He, is, he who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his who tread in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the people no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood splatters on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart and my year of redemption had come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the people in my anger and I made them drunk in my wrath and poured out their lifeblood on the earth. See, it's Jesus who carries out judgment against his enemy with no help from no one else. Notice, notice now, it's very, we see here in chat, it's this massive, massive army that's built up. When he's referring here, he says, when no one helps me, he's referring to the fact that no one is involved in carrying out the judgment of God except him. It doesn't, it doesn't preclude his followers from accompanying him as he carries out that wrath. But Jesus is the one who does it. And so this is the armies of heaven. This is what it looks like. This is what's going on. They follow Jesus as he is the victor. 
And then the contrast is the armies of the earth. We see on verse 19 that the king of the earth also had their armies, right? We expect that. We see that. We understand a little bit of that. And they're just massive armies. They're all gathered, like the whole world gathered. This is why I tell you, for, for all of those ideas that when Jesus comes back and takes his church away, it's going to be a complete surprise and everybody's going to be going around going, what happened? Like the next day, you're going to turn around and go, oh, where'd everybody go? It's not what the Bible says. The Bible's very clear that every eye shall see. Very clear. It's not like you're going to walk around and find a pile of clothes and go, I have no idea where Rod went. The Bible says that every man will see him and they will wail and gnash their teeth at the sight of him. You don't, you, we don't need a camera on the Mount of Olives to try and catch Jesus as if he's going to sneak in. I just, I, again, I can't believe I was watching the Christian Network and all of a sudden this guy I was talking about, he's got all these cameras on the Mount of Olives so they can catch it at the very moment in case anybody misses it. And I'm like, this guy doesn't, he's never read his Bible. If Jesus can forgive my sins as far as the east is from the west, when he comes back, let me tell you something, east and west won't matter anymore. The armies of the earth, massive armies, verse 14, their blood is going to be splattered. Or chapter 14, remember how high we said that the blood would flow in chapter 14? It would be as high as a horse's bridle. It's about armpit high on a normal sized guy, maybe not rod, maybe a little lower than rod. And that it would care, cover an area of nearly 200 miles long. These armies will be no match for Jesus. Every single member of these armies is going to be slain by the word. Five times in this passage there's a reference to the flesh that will be eaten by the birds of the air. As an emphasis to all those who are part of this army. Regardless of their power, their social strength, the weapons they will have. They'll all be slain by the word. So these two armies, they represent two fates for every person who's ever lived on the face of the earth. Those who place their faith in Jesus and remain faithful to him will be part of the army of heaven, which carry out the righteous judgment, and everyone else is a member of the army of earth. Now, we know that not all of them will be physically present at the final battle, but ultimately all of them will suffer the same fate separated from God from eternity, thrown into the lake of fire, joining the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all of those who inhabit this horrible place. you got, you got to see this in your mind as it takes place. Do you, do you realize that when you read your Bible that the only person who gets his garments stained in battle is Jesus? He had a robe dipped in. Ultimately, our enlistment in one of these two armies is dependent on the third area of contrast. And that's the two positions. The first position is those who follow Jesus. Now, Mark chapter 17 is, is interesting. But I want you to notice, it, it said, and Jesus said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. It's very interesting as we think about, okay, Jesus is setting up the world. He's calling us to evangelism, right? But as it is with Jesus, so much of what he says is so much deeper, right? Than just Christian duty. Think about it. I ought to follow Jesus. And when I follow Jesus and I'll, I'll do my Christian duty, I'll tell the world about Jesus. When I follow Jesus, I'll fulfill my Christian role and God will be happy with me because I'll tell the world about Jesus. So much of what we read and how we interpret the Bible is interpreted by how we view life around us and so much of that is a works mentality. Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't say, follow me so that I can teach you how to do your Christian duty. 
He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. There's an aspect of because you follow Jesus, there's a becoming of who he is. There's a becoming of who he is. It's not a, a straining or a struggle. Note the position of the army that comes with Jesus. The Bible says they're what? They're following him. Nobody's leading Jesus from heaven. Jesus is a general who fights from the front. Are you with me, church? Jesus is not parking himself. I love this. He's sometimes a general would park himself on a high hill and, and he would command his army from that high hill so that he could see how the army was going. And if we needed more to the left or more to the right or more push in the middle, this, 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 this general, this king would command us. Our Jesus is not that kind of king. Jesus leads his army. He's not going to park on a cloud and direct the army of heaven to fight his battle. They're not ahead of him. They're not beside him. They're following him. And I think because they're following Jesus, they're spared from the judgment that's being carried out in front of them. You remember, take this note, Jesus. There's this parade of sorts as Jesus is coming through town. And people have gathered around Jesus. There's such a big noise, this clamoring that's going on. And there's this blind man who can hear this parade coming, and he, he senses, someone says, Jesus is coming, and he begins to scream out, Jesus, son of David, and he screamed out, and they tried to shush him. Quiet, don't you know who's coming? Don't you know who's coming? Be quiet. See, there were people who were in front of Jesus. They didn't know what Jesus was doing. Listen, when you're, when you're in front of the leader, you have no idea where the leader's going. Hello, church. They're following him. Because they're following, they're spared from the judgments. Being. And so from that very first public ministry, Jesus has called his disciples to what? Follow me. Jesus is not saying, I need you to follow me to do work. He's saying, I want you to follow me so you'll become like me. So much of our Christian life is spent under the condemnation of duty. Well, if I just read my Bible more, I'll be a better Christian. If I pray more, I'll be a better Christian. If I go to church more, I'll be a better Christian. You know, the fact of the matter is this. Yeah, the more you read your Bible, the more you will know God. The more time, more time you spend in prayer, the more you'll know the heart of God. Right? Absolutely. Those things are all true. The more time, you, more you spend, more time you spend in church, the stronger your life becomes. You know why? Because you build your life then in the fellowship of family. Church is important. All of that's important. Reading your Bible is important. Ask the discipleship guys. We reading on purpose. We're memorizing on purpose. We're praying every day on purpose, right? got our PACs, and we've got our everyday requests. You say, what is the PACs? P-A-C-S, right? Praise, adoration, confession, and supplication. I'm teaching us. God's teaching us how to pray. How we get before the Lord. How we call out to Him. How we put our lives in priority. There's a very, very important principle, guys, contained in the words of Jesus. When we look at what he's saying, when we choose to follow him, he can make us to become what he wants us to be. It's so much different than saying, I need to become what he wants me to be. Than following him and saying, he can make me to become what he wants me to be. And to me, that's resting, that's so refreshing. Because guess what I do? I still read my Bible. I still pray. I do come to church. But not out of duty. All of it's with joy. So learning to follow Jesus is incredible when we realize the depth of what he's saying. So there are those who are following Jesus and then there are those who are before Jesus. They're in front of him. They're the ones who decide to do things their way rather than repent and commit their lives to Jesus. And as a result, they're the ones who became the object of his wrath. Can you imagine, can you imagine what it must be like for those that by, the Lord said, in that day there will be those who say unto me, Lord, Lord, did we not? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Let me ask you something. You think you're casting out a devil in your own power? 
If you do, you've never met one. Amen. <laughs> Did we not clothe the naked and feed the hungry? Do we not heal the sick in your name? Obviously, the power of God's working with them. That blows your mind. And then Jesus looks at him and says, What? I, I didn't know you. Now, to me, I mean, that, if you think about a, a theological conundrum, you've got to go, wait a minute, hold up just a second. How does a person operate in the power of God and yet not know God? We've got to go back to the Old Testament. Right? God used a donkey one day. Hello, church. Can you imagine what it must be that day to think? That because of the things we did for Jesus, then he's obligated to let us in? I'm just challenging you as we talk about the last day, we talk about the return of Jesus Christ. I'm challenging you to think about your walk with Christ. Do we think that God is obligated because of the things we've done for him? Come well, church. That's not the kind of relationship you want to have with other people. Trust me, how deep, how deep are the relationships that you have with people who feel they're obligated to you? How deep are the relationships that you have with the people you feel obligated to? Most of that's walked in condemnation and guilt and shame, isn't it? Sure it is. And you feel a sense of what? Duty. That's why Jesus is saying, look, I don't, I'm not interested in that. The, the disciples come back and they said, Lord, you, got a, you, you have no idea what happened. You should have been there, Jesus. We cast out devils. We healed the sick. Jesus, I'm, I wish you could have been there, Jesus. There's just no way to explain it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Can you imagine telling Jesus he has no idea what it's like to heal the sick? And they're like, Jesus, you don't know. Wait, shh, let us tell you, Jesus. Can you see the rest of them? Oh, hush, my story's better than yours. And you know what Jesus said? He said, fellas, 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 don't rejoice over the fact that demons are subject to you. Rejoice better yet that your name's written down in the Lamb's book of life. And it's so good when we look at Jesus saying, I want you to understand it's more important to follow me than to be before me. I'm not saying that the motivation of heart isn't okay. Uh, you see what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm, what I'm saying, though, is right position is where we need to be. You will find that when you release yourself to follow Jesus, you will rest a whole lot more in your life. Grab this. Whenever we choose to go before Jesus, we take ourselves out from under his protection and we become the subject of experiencing his judgment and wrath. And so since that's the case, we really need to understand this. How do I make sure that I'm in the right position, that I'm following Jesus? Not just out of a sense of duty, not a, a, out of a sense of Christian obligation. Wow, Jesus died for me, so the least I can do is serve him. Have you ever heard that statement from the pulpit? In a sermon, Jesus died for you, so the least you can do. Have you ever heard that? That's not the heart of God. That's not the heart you know, Jesus died for me. Not expecting me to do anything for him. I've really tried to get rid of that idea in my head. When I talk, when I preach, when I minister, when I share that my faith with people, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the least I can do for Jesus because he died for me. Right? I mean, listen, you know, over 20 years ago, my wife, you know, she, she stood an altar and, right, she married me. So the least I can do, you know, is get up and go to work. Give her a paycheck on Friday. Hello, church. Trust in what he's done, not what you have done. Trust in what he's done. 
How can I make sure that I'm in the right position and I'm following Jesus as we think about the return? Jesus is coming back. Do you believe it? I'm asking you, do you really believe it? He's coming back. I want to be in the right position. This is not about praying a prayer some years ago and, and, and worrying about whether, okay, we're once saved, always saved, or are we once saved. This is not about all of that. It's about learning to be in a relationship. Trust in what he's done for you, not in what you've done. This entire account, the armies of heaven, they do nothing but follow Jesus. Are you with me? Jesus is the only one even equipped with a weapon, his word, which he uses to pour out his wrath on all of those who chose not to follow him. And like I said before, in fact, the army in heaven, their garments don't even get stained. How many of you ever wore white? Like, it's difficult. Let me just encourage, you know, we went to Fogo de Chao and... uh, I don't know if it was Chicago or Indianapolis, the one we were at. It doesn't matter. I had on a white shirt, you know. They come and they cut the meat right off the, sp- you know, right off the spit, right on your plate. Down. I mean, it's, oh, it's fabulous, right? They break it right off the fire. They come right over and they just cut it right off onto your plate. Like when I was done, there were blood splatters all over my white shirt. It was worth it. It was worth it. Anybody ever ate at Fogo? Yeah, okay, there's a few. Uh, there's a, one similar in Fort Wayne now called Tucanos, right? It's similar. Uh, Fogo's much better, though. Um, Tugano's is much cheaper. But I, I don't wear, you can't wear white to a barbecue. Like, it's just going to happen. I don't care how you try, right? It's going to happen. Can't wear white to a barbecue. Only Jesus has a robe splattered with blood as he carries out his wrath. See, the principle, it applies to even how he entered into a relationship with Jesus in the first place. Although we usually illustrate the truth of this passage from the New Testament here, uh, I'm going to prove this idea uh, using the Old Testament, though, Um, in order to confirm it like a seamless nature of the Scripture. The first thing we've got to realize is that no matter how many good things we do, When we place those deeds before a holy God, he sees them for what they really are. Isaiah 64 says, We have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Notice the word all in Isaiah 64. It's used three times to make us absolutely clear that every single person is a sinner and that we, what we consider to be righteous deeds doesn't impress God. So should we just stop doing anything for God at all? No, that's not what I'm saying, right? What I'm saying is that true relationship with God produces the beautiful works But no matter how beautiful your works are, they will never produce salvation. They will never produce it. And that's what I'm saying. See, even David said that obedience is better than sacrifice. He said, Lord, if I I thought that fat is what you wanted, that's what I get. I would have put it on the altar, but that's not what you want. What you want is obedience. So in this case, how do we get right with God so that we can enter into a relationship with him? Well, these words from Proverbs are so powerful. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 8, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. He will make straight your path. Do not, do not be wise in your own eyes. The Bible says, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. We've got to acknowledge to God that our ways and our understandings are ever, never, ever, never. It's like like infinity. 
and capable of earning his favor. It's just, there's no way to earn the favor of the Lord. So we place all our trust in him, our faith in him, in God alone. When we're struggling, when we're down, when we've lost, when we've experienced pain and hurt and all the things that we think, wow, I'm never going to overcome. God comes to say, absolutely, that's why I'm here. We trust in what he's already done for us, not what we can do for ourselves. The Bible says that a reverent fear of God leads us to repentance. We've got to learn to trust God and what he's doing. It's, it's described for us by the prophet again, Isaiah 53. And you think, wow, you're using the book of Isaiah. Well, I told you, you've got to, you've got to look at these books. You've got to look at these books. Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, to understand what God is saying here. It's described for us, and he says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chast- chast- chastisement and brought us peace. With his stripes we are healed. We are like sheep who have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Our discipleship guys will remember that as a memory verse. This is obviously... A prophecy about who? The Messiah. If you read the whole chapter there, and I encourage you to do it, Isaiah 53, you'll you'll see an amazing account of how Jesus came to the earth, took all our sins upon himself, and suffered and died to pay the penalty for those sins. The only way, the only way I can make sure I'm following Jesus is... Trusting in what he's done for me. Even after we made that commitment, we need to continue to live our lives day to day depending on what God, depending on what God has done and not what we can do. It's so easy to pick back up our own strength, isn't it? I mean, one day we laid it down and we trusted in Jesus, but now we find ourselves trying again to do it. And the Lord is saying, why? I thought we, I thought we dealt with that already. Early in the chapter, those garments were identified as righteous deeds of the saints. So that's a, a, the, that verb, arrayed, right, um, indicates that someone else has clothed them. They didn't do it themselves. That's completely, completely consistent with what we saw in verse 8. So the bride, the ability to carry out those righteous deeds, not in her own. So how to make sure I'm following Jesus? Trust in what he's done for you, not what you've done for yourself. And then the last thing here I want you to understand, have a loose grip. Have a loose grip on the things of the world. And this is so much a message for the Western church. Because materialism is, oh, it is the tool of Satan. People ask me all the time, oh, Pastor Don, how come you go uh, around the world and you come back and tell these these stories about, uh, you know, the manifestations of, of, you know, activity of, of the enemy and those? How come we don't see that kind of stuff? Because the, Satan doesn't have to act that way here. He's not as blinded with materialism. And, and that, listen, in Africa, they're not blinded by materialism. It's not that he doesn't. He does. But if you think about during Jesus' earthly ministry, he spoke these words in Luke chapter 9. And verse 23, he says, And I said to you all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and daily follow me. Now, we normally use this as a picture of just taking up a cross here, illustrating the idea that we've got to die to self, which is okay. But it's it's not the only part of the depth of what Jesus was saying. There's a lot more to what Jesus is trying to communicate to us. The, The word translated cross here is the same word used as a tent stake. Interesting. In this particular passage, in Luke chapter 19, 9, verse 23, the word translated cross is the same word used as a tent stake. Now, how many of you know what a tent stake is? Now, we're in a tent ministry. You know what we use for stakes? Car axles. Ask my wife. She'd go to the junkyard and buy car axles, and that's what we used for tent stakes. We had a big head on them, so whoever was driving it had a big target to hit, you know? Whoever was holding it was, was pretty secure that this big round thing would protect my hand. 
And it drives deep and they're made out of iron. You're not going to miss them. So what does this mean? Why, why, do, why, do, why is it important that we understand that idea, this, this tent stake or this peg? If Jesus is using it in that sense, then what he's doing is he's telling us that those who would follow him don't get entrenched where you're at. Because you might need to pull up your tent stake because guess what we're doing? We're following him. And it, it, I think it's further, it, later on in the chapter, uh, verses 57 through 62, it says this, and as we were going along the road, someone said, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to this person, foxes have holes, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go, bury my father. And Jesus said, leave the dead to bury the dead. That seems cruel, doesn't it? Jesus isn't talking about compassion. What he's talking about, he's saying there's a time that you, we, we are moving now forward. Listen to what he says here. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those who are at home. And Jesus said, no one who puts his hand to the plow looks back fit for the kingdom. Another one said to him later on, well, hey, I married a wife, Right? Another one said, I got some ox. I got to go. Right? On and on and on. There's these excuses. This all is so it's consistent with the principle we find here in, in the events that we see that we're hanging on too tightly to the things of the world if we want to follow Jesus. Do you know that following Jesus will cause you to let go of some relationships? Sorry. Do you know that following Jesus will cause you to let go? Of some worldly goods. Come on church. Following Jesus. John even said it in his epistle. He says do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world the love of the father is not in him. For all that is in this world. The desires of the flesh. The desires of the eye. And the pride of life. Or pride in possessions. Is not from the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. See, if we love the things of the world more than we love Jesus, we're going to have a real hard time following Jesus. Last but not least, we've got to imitate Jesus. Now, I mentioned earlier, the armies of heaven, they imitate Jesus, they're following Jesus. Just like Jesus, they were what? They were riding on white horses. Wait a minute, I thought that's reserved for the king. The army, they're white, riding on white horses. If it's truly following Jesus, then we'll attempt to imitate him as we live our lives out day to day. You remember that old Gatorade commercial? Long time ago, featured Michael Jordan. Right? And it says, be like Mike. Remember that? That's a famous quote. I just want to be like Mike. And he's drinking a Gatorade. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, then we need to be like Jesus. Hello, church. Here's what Paul wrote when he wrote to Rome. And the guys in the discipleship class, if you're on the reading schedule with us, you, you're working through Romans right now. And it's such a powerful book of the grace of God. For those... In verse 8, chapter 29, he said, For those whom he foreknown, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. There's a big controversy about all of that, whether some are predestined to be in heaven and some are predestined to be in hell and all that. Listen, you've got to understand the idea of predestination. All that simply means is this. Let me help you out. Are you ready? It's going to bless you. God looks through the filter of the finished work of the cross of Calvary and he sees every man and woman saved. He predestined through that act that everyone would be saved. Because of the free will of man and Revelation chapter 19, we understand that not everybody will, right? Because God doesn't violate a free will. But that doesn't stop God from looking through the filter of the cross and saying... 
That's why Jesus said that day on the cross, what? It is finished. That's God's plan. The predestined plan of God is for us to be with Him, church. Do you understand that? That was from the beginning. Before God foreknew, before God hung a star in the sky, before God put the cosmos in play, it was His predestined plan that we would be here with Him. See, the idea of evolution is that, listen, or the Big Bang Theory, as you cry and cross it with Christianity, is that you are second thought. But you're not second thought. You're first thought. That's why the cosmos exists. You're the first thought. So God had to create some place for you to live. It's not like God created some place and then went, Oh, I'm a little bored with this. What else can we put down here? It's not like God's got an ant farm with no ants in it. See, that's the idea of of this idea that we're second thought. That the, the creation is more important than us. We, we see all of creation as an ant farm with no ants. And God says, well, what if we put some ants in? It'll spice it up a little bit. No, your first thought, your first, you are first thought. And you need to understand this beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's why God loves you. That proves that God loves you. That he would create the whole cosmos so you could exist. And then he would come and dwell with us and die for us so that we could be with him in all of eternity in the beauty of his glory. Church, your first thought, that's how much he loved you. The cosmos exists because God loved me. Do you understand if one star is out of line, everything else is out of line? Do you realize that if the moon would move out of its place, that life on earth would cease to exist? Do you understand that if the sun would move out of its perfect plot, that life on earth would cease to exist? Do you understand that if earth would move out of its perfect position, that life on earth would cease to exist? Listen to me, church. We don't need to go to Mars to find life. We got life right here, and Jesus came to give it to us. Creation exists because God loves me. That'll help you look at outer space a whole lot different. When you look at the beauty of the stars, when you look at the beauty of the cosmos, when you look at the planets, and you think about the great, great depth and and width of it, you can think all of that is there because God loves me. Tonight, you go outside and look up at the stars. You can think and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that all of that is there because God loves you. That's so good. That's not my notes. That's all free. So, The beauty of the created cosmos is because God loves you. Man. Several years ago, I'm going to close with this. Uh, a psychologist at the University of Michigan did a study. And he found that, are you ready? Couples who bore no particular resemblance to each other when they first got married, that after 25 years of being married, began to look like each other. Hey, it's your college, okay? I'm from Florida, right? I'm just telling you. The University of Michigan. And the, and, it, and the study went on to say, and I give you a million of dollars for this study, are you right? And the study goes on to say this, that the higher degree of marital happiness that the couple reported, the greater increase of facial resemblance. The same thing occurs in our relationship with Jesus. The more time we spend with him, the better we get to know him, the greater the likelihood that we will be conformed to his image and his likeness. How many meet that old sweet couple that have been married for like ever? Right? And and you look at them and you think, they're more like brother and sister than they are husband and wife. Right? I mean, just like, like... Lisa's grandparents, Avon and Jean. Some of you have met Avon and Jean, right? Like, these two are hilarious. They are absolutely hilarious. And they're they're like in their early 90s. Yeah, so they're close. I mean, Granda's 90, and she's like 80, 87 or something. And, And I mean, they're just the cutest old couple. 
right? And you, you, they almost finish each other's sentences sometimes. And I love to see them squabble. Like granddad was driving us to their favorite restaurant one day. Let me tell you, it was, it's an awful restaurant. We always hated it. The food was terrible, but they loved it. And we're like, we're going to take you out to eat, grandmom and granddad. Where do you want to go? Oh, we want to go to Bessinger's. And we're like, oh, okay, here we go. And then granddad's like, oh, I'm going to drive. And we're like, no, granddad, we'll drive. He's like, no, I'm going to drive. Granddad would be in the front of the car. Grandma would be sitting in the car. We'd be in the back seat. I remember this, my wife and I, plain as day. It was so funny. Granddad's trying to drive to the restaurant. Grandma's trying to tell him how to get there. <laughs> he looks over. Her name's Avon. Her name, his name's Gene. And he said, Avon, if you don't shut up, I'm going to put you in the trunk. And I think he meant it. It was hilarious. There's so much alike. One day, grand, granddad was flirting with one of the waitresses. Granddad used to always flirt with all the waitresses. And uh, grandma, just, she just whacked him across the head with the, with the menu. It was hilarious. Maybe, maybe northern old people aren't like southern old people. I don't know. Yeah, they sound sweet, don't they? They were hilarious. It was always entertaining. We're we going to go to Grandmom and Granddad's. Yes, it's going to be so entertaining. Uh, it's the same thing, though. See, when we fall in love with Jesus, we spend time with Jesus. We, the, the greater our likelihood is to be more like Him. Here, here's my final question tonight: Are you following Jesus? I didn't ask you if you were a Christian. I didn't ask you where you went to church. I didn't ask you what denomination you were. I didn't even ask you if you were saved. See, this question answers it all. Especially when we look at the return of Jesus. Hello, church. Because if you're following Jesus, you're in a great blessing. If you're not, you're getting ahead of Jesus and you're doing things your own way, then there's some serious consequences. And the choice is yours. That's Revelation chapter 19. Jesus has returned. And we can't answer this question in Revelation chapter 20. You need to understand. You can't answer this question in Revelation chapter 20. You have to answer it before Revelation chapter 19. That's very important. Stand with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Sometimes we come here, God, and we expect to maybe receive some revelation of some mystical idea that's written in the scripture. But God, I'm so grateful that Peter says that there's no private interpretation, that everything is plain. But Lord, you're more concerned with us being ready for your return than you are with us knowing the details of that return. And God, for all that's out there over this great book of worship, for all the New Age click, for all the end times to try to understand, Father, I thank you that you just make it simple that it's this, you're concerned that we're ready when you come back. And so, Lord, I say tonight that whether you come back tonight, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, or, Lord, whether you tarry for 50 more years, it matters not to us because we are ready. And Lord, if you do tarry, we're ready to serve tomorrow. If you do come back tonight, we are ready to go home with you. So, Lord, thank you for the revelation of who you are so that we can follow you. In Jesus' precious name, everyone said, amen. Give the Lord a hand. Turn around and tell somebody you love them.